respected principal sir dr ajay sharma dean sciences at iit dr sajeev soni our guest speaker dr harpreet bohra head of the department dr indu mehta faculty members and dear students myself dr preeti kalia on behalf of zoology department gjd sd college chandigarh welcomes you all for the international webinar on the topic an optimal experience of pro cytometry at jcsmr engage enjoy and create by our eminent speaker dr harpreet bohra a flow cytometry specialist and manager at john curtin school of medical research in the australian national university we thank you ma'am from the bottom of our heart for taking time from your busy schedule to be here with us today it is my absolute pleasure to invite our worthy principal sir dr ajay sharma to deliver the welcome address principal sir dr kharpreet vora from australian national university my faculty members and dear students it is indeed a matter of great privilege that we have uh, such an eminent speaker today to share his uh, share her experiences with us you know that uh, it has actually uh, make this uh, global world well connected and uh, it's a very uh, good moment for, for us to have madam with us uh, ma'am our college is college of potential excellence from university grants commission uh, new delhi it is having a nac a plus status from the national accreditation council and uh, star college status from bottom biotechnology and department of science and technology new delhi government of india and there are a number of credentials which uh, our departments are having and our zoology department in particular is very active in organizing different uh, programs uh, of academics and beyond academics also and our sciences are now having research centers also in the area of physics biotechnology and chemistry and uh, in future we want to have more uh, program of this nature your presence certainly will be motivating factor for all of us especially for the young uh, budding scientists which are attending your program so welcome madam and whenever you come to the uh, india i will request you to uh, visit our college so that we can have the much better attraction and can learn a lot from you uh, welcome and uh, hopefully i will request the students to make it interactive and uh, have maximum benefit of the presence of such an eminent scientist today thanks a lot thank you so much sir for such an inspiring and motivating words i would like to invite dr sonika to formally introduce our today's guest over to you sonika ma'am <laughs> Uh, good morning everyone thank you dr priti uh, i feel privileged in formally introducing our today's speaker as dr priti has already mentioned the topic for today's lecture is the working on flow cytometry flow cytometry which is one of the most powerful tool in advanced science research in field of microbial immunology yeah. to make us aware about yeah. the technique it's working and creating something new our speaker is the most suitable one she is the woman of virtue and simplicity i feel elated to introduce all of you formally with a very impressive and beautiful personality proving to be an absolute example of beauty with brains she is an eminent established personality in the field of flow cytometry Dr Harpreet Bora our today's guest she has done her MSc in honors in microbiology and degree of PhD in the microbial immunology in the field of parasitic immunology due to her outstanding performances and contribution during her research period she was awarded welcome trust fellowship for application of PCR in diagnosis of hygiene and tropical medicine london uk in 1999 in continuation to that again in 2001 bam was awarded welcome trust fellowship for new immunological techniques by london school of hygiene and tropical medicine in 2001 she has keen interest in work in the medical parasitology for that she has worked as an assistant professor in department of experimental medicine and biotechnology and bgimer chandigarh till 2004 after that ma'am has not looked back and is having more than 80 publication in various reputed search journals 
Presently, ma'am is working as a specialist and manager of flow cytometry faculty at John Curtin University School of Medical Research under the Australian National University, Canberra. On the behalf of faculty, I'm very much thankful to you, ma'am, for sparing time for your such a busy schedule and joining us on the virtual platform. Now, I'm not taking so much time of all, and I invite our distinguished speaker, ma'am, Dr. Harpreet Bora, to please share your experiences with the audience, which is waiting anxiously to listen to you. Over to you, ma'am, please. Thank you very much, um, Preeti, and um, um, your principal, um, and everybody who said so many kind words for me. So thank you very much. It's absolutely my pleasure to interact with you all and the students as well. I hope they feel inspired and motivated for um, at least pursuing their interest in science. So I switched gear from pure research academic position to have this technical position where I can enjoy my job really very well. And I've been here since 2004, like you mentioned. Um, now my presentation is more about an interaction rather than a lecture. And um, I'm happy to take questions in the end. And as Indra told me, um, there will be about 15 minutes to allow for any uh, questions that the students might have or uh, your staff might have. But before I start, I also want to thank Indu for contacting me for sure. Um, and I want to congratulate the entire staff for the achievements as your principals mentioned that uh, you guys have been doing really, really well and exceptional work. So congratulations to all of you. Um, very well done. And now I'm just going to get started with my presentation, which is pretty much, as I said, is an interaction rather than a formal presentation of what I do, how I do, and um, why do I love it, um, what I do. Um, so um, that's why the title of my topic is um, an optimal experience of flow cytometry at JCSMR. Um, and in this role as a specialist and a manager, I engage with the users of the facility, which are more than 100 or so uh, research groups. And I um, interact with the um, academic staff, the students, the postgraduates, undergraduate, et cetera. I absolutely love what I do. And I love to create more experiments, more applications which are suited to the research requirements and also the clinical requirements. Um, in my heart, I have a special place for immunology and medical research. So I continue to pursue that. To introduce you to the faculty, um, the facility staff, it's just me and another person, Mick DeVoy. Um, together we look after at least 11 instruments and make sure that they are ready and um, quality control tested and performance tested so that the users can come and use them uh, for um, taking back the quality data. So that's primarily my goal at maintenance of this facility. So um, in my role, I do um, some teaching as well to the undergraduates because our school runs the molecular immunology course. So I teach in that, but also interact with the postgraduates our school is um, uh, post-graduation, so we have honors, masters, and PhD students. I run introductory sessions, uh, workshops on specific topics of interest, and I also run trainings for application specialists or um, people who join as application specialists in the companies which sell our reagents, our instruments, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty much interacting with people at all different levels to make sure that, um, well, I learn from them as well, and I share my knowledge with them um, all the time. I mentioned that we've got a few instruments in our facility, and some of them are listed right here. Um, we have two kinds of flow cytometers. I'll come to what are flow cytometers in a minute. However, um, just broadly speaking, we have two kinds of flow cytometers, one where you can sort the cells of interest back for any future experiments to culture them or to put them back in the animals or to see how they behave in the, um, you know, by themselves or to extract any nuclear material from those cells. So if you need to recover the cells of interest back, then we've got 
what we call our cell sorters. But if you only need to characterize your cells, then we just have cell analyzers as well. We also have instruments which can take a photo of the cell as um, the cells go through the machine. And they take a photo of every single cell that is going through the machine. And these instruments are um, also known as emit cytometers. So various versions of those. Um, I'm just going to be interrupting my uh, presentation with a couple of photos here and there just to keep your interest on and show you exactly what's happening here. So this was a practical that is run for undergraduate students where they are shown how to do uh, the staining of the cells, how to prepare the samples to run on the instrument, and then how to run the instrument, set up, et cetera, and how do you analyze the results. Um, the classes can sometimes be really big as well, up to 70 in a class. I know by Indian standards, probably 70 doesn't sound too much, and I've done bigger classes back in India, but he, 70 is a good big number. We also run smaller batches of um, training sessions for uh, people who will be using the machines, so not being shown this time, but they will be using the machines 24-7. Um, so they are trained to a point that, first, they don't break our instruments, and two, they can take good data back. So we do run different kinds of trainings as well. Um, so what I, I will be talking to you today will be a little bit about the technique that I um, have expertise in. What can you do when you run this um, run your cells on that instrument, like what do you really measure? And um, what are the kind of wider applications that you can use this machine um, to get some, some information about your cells? And then of course, um, because my expertise is pretty much in microbiology, I can talk about some applications in microbiology, but I'll just be limiting to the broad applications. Like I said, this is not a lecture lecture. It's more about introducing a topic to you and I'm more than happy for anyone to um, send me an email after or for any other questions that you might have. And a couple of my recent works, which are some of my recent publications, I will talk about those as well. So first of all, what is cytometry? Well, we know that it is a technique for making multi-parametric measurements on the cells as they flow in a single file past the light source. And how all of that brings together, I will follow up in the next slide. However, just gonna say that, that we measure properties of the cells, which we use that information to characterize the cells. So we know that just in our human system, we've got hundreds of cell types. And um, you may not know so much now, but you know, since COVID arrived, that we've been talking about the cells which are important in um, combating the infections, then there are cells which are um, doing different things in the body, all sort of immune cells and whatnot. We need to know the subtypes of those cells as well, and we need to characterize those cells to understand them a bit better. And hence, these instruments are extremely powerful in telling us the properties of that cell so that we characterize them, and then we can sort a population of interest to do more in-depth studying or more in-depth profiling of those cells. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. But because we run the cells one by one, obviously we can count them. Um, when the cells are running, the light from the lasers shines on those cells and the cells scatter that light. We measure that light to determine the relative size and granularity or internal complexity of the cell, which is very unique to every cell type, right? For example, your red blood cells are not as complex as, let us say, macrophages or your lymphocytes. And I'm not sure. I, I think you people come from a range of um, um, backgrounds. So I'm not going to go into specific cell, cell types here, um, but just going to say that every cell is unique in how it is made up. And that gives it a unique signature. And hence, we can identify a cell based on that. Also, we can characterize the cell based on the molecules that are expressed on the surface of the cell or inside the cell. And on these machines, what we need to do is to characterize that expression, we incubate the cells with the antibodies which are directed to those molecules. And these antibodies are conjugated to the fluorochromes. So indirectly, we measure the relative fluorescence intensity that is associated with the cell which tells us the relative expression of the molecule on the cell. We measure not an average of that expression. 
we measured the expression of every molecule on every cell that goes through the machine. <coughs> Pardon me. Because we can do that, we can also find out which cells are dead, which cells are living, and we can run the cells really, really fast as well. <coughs> Sorry, say, sorry, say again. <laughs> sorry, I don't know what was that going on. So we can run the cells really fast in um, our instruments. That means about 10 to 20,000 cells per second. That means we can put through millions and millions of cells very quickly and get lots of information about these cells. And then we can collect the cells back of our collect the cells back, um, the ones that we are interested in for any subsequent analysis. So pretty much the bottom line is we measure the light that is scattered, emitted, or absorbed by the cells to get information for all the measurable parameters of the cells. And I think I'll be talking about that in a minute. Um, but first of all, how do we get the information from the cells? So Here's a slide showing you the journey of cells to the dots because on your computer screens of the machines, all you get to see is the dots. But how do these dots, <coughs> pardon me, how do the cells come up as dots? So um, the cells, which we need in the form of suspension, are put on the machine and the cells are focused to run one by one past the light sources. And the instrument can have a number of light sources, which are lasers. And these lasers shine light on the cells as the cells are running through the machine at this particular point. At that point, let me talk about what's happening here. So different lasers shine light on the cells and the cells will either absorb that light, emit more light from the fluorochromes associated with it, or these cells will just scatter that light. So all of that information with the light is going to tell us the different characteristics of the cells. So in the path of the emitted light, we put different filters, et cetera, to capture a light of specific wavelength. And we measure that light. That light is converted by the electronics into a corresponding voltage pulse. And the intensity of this voltage pulse tells us the amount of light that reached the detector. Now, that intensity of the voltage pulse is given a number. It's given an intensity number. And on our computer screens, a dot appears for every single cell. For example, I'm sorry. Oops. So for example, here, all cells which were expressing this molecule, that is CD3, got a high signal as compared to these ones. And therefore, all these cells are positive for the expression of this particular molecule. And also, if you look here, these are the dots, these are the cells which got a positive signal for this molecule, that is CD4. And so we characterize another cell type, which is CD4 positive. Now, all of these are subtypes of the lymphocytes, so I'm not gonna get into that. But all I'm saying is on the computer screen, the cells that you have run, a dot appears for every single cell, and you characterize your cells based on the expression of cells of first molecules or intracellular molecules. <clears throat> There'll be more to learn, and there's lots of videos available online as well, but I, I just want to give you a nutshell of what these instruments can do. So these are some of the large instruments that we have in our facility. These are the cell sorters where you can isolate a cell of interest, even one cell. We can put that in a plate for you, and then you can have it growing into a clone, etc. We have these machines sitting in the hood pretty much, just because we do a lot of sterile sorts. I sort cells from um, animals, humans, plants, tonsils, tissues, pancreas, everywhere. So if you can get me the cells, I can sort them for you. Even the plant roots or the flower or the leaves of the plant, there's lots of ways to get the cells. And if you can bring the cells, we can put them through the machine, but some people need it sterile so that they can put them back in the animals to study the effects of those. Now, obviously these instruments run on buffers and therefore they're big buffer tanks always sitting under our machines um, to support that. These machines 
you can run your samples in the tubes, but you can also run them in the plate. So if you've got thousands of cells, all you need to do is put your samples in the 96 well plate and then load the plate and the instrument will just pick up cells from every well and capture the information for you. And you can do plate after plate. That means really high throughput analysis you can do on hundreds of samples for hundreds of parameters. <clears throat> I mentioned lasers as the light sources in our instruments, and here's a picture from inside the instruments. And this is showing you the yellow green laser, the red laser, the violet laser, and the blue laser as well. So these are five laser instruments that we have in our facility, but the light from all of these lasers is focused on one focusing lens, and that entire light shines at a point where the cells are running. So in this picture, you can see here's the cells pushed into this, and that's the focus light. So as the cells travel here, this light comes up and shines on the cells and generates all those signals. Now, all those signals are then sent to the detectors. And in the path of these detectors, we've got an array of filters which pick up a light of certain wavelength, and they convert those light signals, which are in the form of photons of light, into an electronic pulse or a voltage pulse to tell us how much of that light was associated with that cell to give us that information. Now, if that sounds too complicated, um, you can ask me questions and I'm more than happy to explain that a little bit more. I've just kept it very simply because I do understand that you people come from different backgrounds. There's many, many applications of dose imagery in every single field. It used to be mostly an immunology technique, but now of course it's everywhere. The main uh, application still remains as phenotyping. So phenotyping pretty much means characterizing the phenotype of your cell based on the expression of molecules, either on the surface of the cell or inside the cells. And immunophenotyping pretty much because majority of the time this phenotyping was done in the immune competent cells or the cells which are, which are part of the immune system. But of course you can characterize any single cell. So all these are examples of uh, the types of applications which can be done on these instruments, but you could characterize these um, applications that um, you could use the flow cytometers to study the state of the cell. That is, what is it expressing on its surface? Is um, the cell in a dividing phase or a resting phase, or is it getting ready to divide? Um, whether the cell is dying, and if it is dying, then is it dying by apoptosis or necrosis, or is it just the natural death, or the cell is not happy in whatever media that you have suspended your cells in, et cetera? And if the cell is ready to divide, then how is it dividing? Is it under any pressure or can you improve the division or how long does it take to divide, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those applications are absolutely possible by flow cytometry. You could also study the cell function. That is, if the cell is getting activated, what is it using to get activated? What molecules activated and what molecules are part of the cascade or the system which help it stay activated? Do the cells die when they're getting activated? Now, some of the cells, when they get activated, they also release intracellular calcium. So we can measure the release of that additional calcium from the stores by these instruments. And some of the cells, when they get activated, they secrete certain molecules, and we can study the, um, these molecule secretion as well by flow sedimentary. It's just that we have to stop the secretion by blocking the secretion by the surface. And then we accumulate that um, molecule, which is about to be secreted in the cytoplasm. And then we uh, fix the membrane of the cell. We push the antibodies through the membrane and stain the cells um, with those antibodies inside the cell membrane. And therefore determine how much of that um, molecule was accumulated inside to see what, what was about to be secreted by the cells. So um, all of these different things, and also reactive oxygen species, intracellular reactive oxygen species are very critical because they kill the cells if you get too much in the cell. So um, if the cell is um, dying via 
producing more reactive oxygen species? Well, we can check that out by close cytometers as well. Of course, in microbiology, most of the times these applications have been used. That is the dead and alive discrimination in the live cultures, counting of the live cells, and also time point if you wanted to know if the cells are dividing, are they, how quickly are they dividing, and um, different time points or response to the drugs and stuff like that. An example of a couple of techniques that we use in our facility. So the first one is gene expression. So obviously you can study the gene expression in your cells by um, using some targeted percent proteins, and then you can determine how many are positive, et cetera. You can check out whether your cells are uh, live or not by using viability assays and by using specific fluorochromes which go and bind to the dead cells or specifically bind only to the live cells. So different ways. Phenotyping I've mentioned already is a very, very popular technique for identifying cells, the expression of molecules on the surface of the cells. <coughs> Pardon me, for, um, for characterizing different cell types. Now, cell cycle analysis is what I mentioned earlier. You can determine whether your cells are in the resting phase or they are dividing or they are getting ready to divide and have they started duplicating their DNA, which is the S phase of the cells. And once they have duplicated their DNA, they have two times the DNA content. That is when they are called as G2. And then they get into their mitotic phase had me, and then they're ready to divide into two. So all of this is done by using DNA dyes, which go in the cells and then specifically bind to the DNA and can determine the actual DNA content. And you can tell whether the cell is ready to divide or not. Um, this can be uh, combined with another assay, which is a proliferation assay, because as the cells get ready to proliferate, they incorporate new nucleotides in them. And if in the media, we provide analogs to those nucleotides, the cells, the newly made DNA will have new nucleotides, which will be the analogs of actual nucleotides. And then we can stain the cells with those uh, antibodies which are directed to the analogs. And therefore we can then identify the newly incorporated nucleotides or the newly made DNA which tells us that these are the cells which have only just started to uh, increase their DNA amount and they are the ones which are ready to divide. And then we can differentiate them from the cells which are actually absolutely ready to divide and then go back into the diploid phase again. <coughs> I'm so sorry, I don't know why um, I've got this nagging cough here. Sorry about that. <coughs> And then, of course, you can um, do the apoptosis studies to see if the cells are beginning to die by apoptosis. <coughs> Pardon me. And you can also discriminate the three states of apoptosis, when it's early, it's late, and whether it's fully necrotic, that is the cell is absolutely disrupted. Um, based on the DNA content, we can also do um, AT versus GC analysis, because we do have fluorochromes which go and bind specifically to the AT region and specifically to the GC region. So if we do AT versus GC ratios and determine that on the instruments, <coughs> pardon me, then um, based on that, we can sort different chromosomes as well, because we know that um, all the chromosomes in our cells, they have different amount of DNA and they also differ in their AT and GC content. And based on just that, we can differentiate all the different chromosomes and we can sort them. And then you can study each one of the chromosomes individually for more information. One very interesting essay that I really enjoy doing is tracking the cell proliferation. So we load the cells with a certain fluorochrome. <coughs> and this fluorochrome, as the cell divides, the amount of fluorochrome is halved in the daughter cells. <coughs> and as the cell divides second time, the fluorochrome intensity divides even more. 
So it gets divided four times. So this one gets one fourth, this gets half, and this gets all the fluorochrome. <coughs> that means that this is the brightest cell that hasn't divided. When it divides first time, the intensity is half. When it divides second time, the intensity is one fourth. And then when it divides more times, it gets diluted even more. So you can track in culture how many times the cell has divided. And if you're trying to see the influence of any drugs or any, anything that you're trying to induce the proliferation or division of the cell, this is a great way to study the progress of the cells in the culture. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm so sorry. And so you can color these, you can color these. You can sorry. have some, some water or some candy in your mouth. Oh, I've got my water. <laughs> Okay, okay. So, must be dry because we are still wearing a mask at our facility. So, I have to wear a mask all the time. So, that okay. just dries up the whole system. It's going so interesting. Um, and uh, so many students already have joined. So, that's perfectly, you are doing perfectly fine. And uh, so, please continue. Sure. Thank you, Indu. So, as you can see, we can color different populations which have divided, we can identify them. And if we have identified them based on the expression of certain molecules, as you can see here, these are positive, those would be negative, that's positive. So they're different populations. We've identified them, whether they are dividing or not. We can see the amount of DNA they have. We can see the molecules that they're expressing on their surface. We can see whether they are resting or not and then whether they are dying or not, and so many other features of the cells when we study, then we need to express our results. Yes, Sabina, you've got a question for me. Sabina? I see your hands up there. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know what was that about. <clears throat> In case anybody needs a question, Please, after the session, you may ask the questions. Good idea. Good idea. Yeah. <clears throat> I did see your hands up. Okay, so I'll just continue. So once we've identified different features of the cell now, then you want to express your results as well. And to show the results, you can see here that this is one really good way to show the results as well. You can express them as phenograms or any other way. But if you are expressing results for many, many kinds of, um, in this case, donors, but it can be many, many samples and you want to present the combined results of that many subtypes of cells. So see, there are about, I think, 40 listed subtypes of cells here. And all these subtypes are here. They are presented in a 3D space in a phenogram, as we call it. And that allows you to quickly compare these 40 subtypes of cells in different um, donors, for example. And you can see the differences straight away. For example, this subpopulation is this subpopulation, number one, which is naive CD4. So naive CD4 population one is much more in this donor as compared to this donor. But this donor has more of this population, which is 36 population, which is classical monocytes. So, this donor has more classical monocytes and this donor has more naive CD4 cells. So this is an easiest way of comparing many different subtypes um, by quick um, phenograms. And you can see the differences straight away. This particular donor has high intensity of this subtype of cell, which is number 10. And number 10 is naive CD8. So all these donors are different. And just in one look, you can see the differences in different donors straight away by presenting your results in this way. But there are many other ways to present the results as well. This was just one easy way to do it. But to get to the phenogram, you need to identify all these cell populations first. And that is done by <clears throat> identifying the cells by selecting the gate or selecting the cell population of interest by making a gate around that. 
and then do subsetting for different subtypes. For example, subsets of basophil, subsets of NK cells, subsets of B cells, subsets of dendritic cells, <clears throat> subsets of CD3 cells, and subsets of CD4 cells, subsets of CD8 cells. And then you generate that information and then put that together in a phenogram for a quick look and comparison of results. <coughs> Okay, now that we know that it is complicated, we can do so much, but yes, you can do so much. On the new machine that we have acquired, we can do 41 molecules on the cell in any given time, and we can do that for millions of cells. So, and the information will tell me the expression of every molecule for every single cell that goes through the machine. So in the end, your result has that much data that you need to condense and present. And therefore, the question that you ask at the start of your experiment is very critical. I'm just gonna to present to you some of the results of some of my latest publications and see how people have used this technology in a really clever way to answer big science questions. So bear with me, let's go through it. I'll present it super simply. <clears throat> in this case, the first um, article that uh, sort of not very recently it was published in Nature. So if you do read um, science articles, then you would know that Nature is the top journal. Um, this was published in 2017 and I was part of this publication. Um, in this particular case, um, it was shown that the T, one of the subsets of the T cells, which is one of the in main immune competent cells in our blood, that subset was identified as T follicular helper cell. Now, normally the dopamine we know is secreted by the cells of the nervous system, <clears throat> but it was found out that the T follicular helper cells also produce dopamine, and they do that <clears throat> when they are coming in contact with the B cells to activate them. Now, also in this study, we did an experiment to find out <clears throat> that this dopamine release is useful in forming a synapse of T cells and B cell. And that is a really big advantage in the face of an infection because once the B cells get activated, they will produce antibodies. But nobody knew that the T cells can also produce dopamine. And we did that by close side hunters. <clears throat> Another very interesting article that I was part of was um, this one, the regulatory role of IL-10 producing human follicular T cells. So don't worry about all the description of what it is, but it was also published in a very high ranking journal, which is Journal of Experimental Medicine in 2019. In this case, we did something, another interesting work. We took human tonsil uh, from the kids which um, have eaten too much ice cream and their tonsils needed to be removed. Uh, and those tonsils were brought to the lab and then um, we processed them and um, identified this population of cells this time, which is T follicular cells from the human tonsil. So normally we know that they control antibody responses, but little did we know that a subset of this so normally this subset itself is only 0.2%, but a subset of this population also can help prevent allergic reaction. So we did sort the population of interest first, so it can do that on our sorters. And then what we showed was that a subset of T follicular cells, which is expressing this molecule on its surface, helps to boost the um, response so that the risk to allergy is reduced. So that is super important. Of course, it's a research finding, uh, but can have long-term findings for limiting the allergies as well. <clears throat> this is another one that I've been part of um, um, a big team that did this work. Now, normally, um, I don't know how much advanced immunology you guys have done, and I'm happy to answer that question later if you want more details, but this was a more fun um, um, paper. In this case, it was shown pretty much 
it was published in immun immunity, which is also one of the very top ranking journals in immunology. So class switch recombination occurs infrequently in germinal centers. And until this time, it was always thought that the class switch recombination occurs in the germinal centers. But in this paper, we showed that it doesn't. But the interesting thing was that the journal decided to put our um, presentation on the cover. And for the cover, a uh, painting was designed by this Australian Aboriginal artist who depicted the um, study on in a painting. And so pretty much he showed that on this cover, I'll just explain the cover, don't worry about that. <clears throat> that normally what happens is that um, this fruit tree around the river, this is what is the general process. So normally in the beginning, before the class switch is committed, it's got different kinds of isotope, isotypes, right? But once it's committed, so this is the germinal center, once it's committed, it is only one isotype. So that means this switch to being one only happens outside of germinal center, not in the germinal center. This is what that painting was about. <clears throat> So pretty much historically, we have always thought that it happens in the germinal centers. In this case, we showed this interaction is happening before the germinal centers. And for that, we had used complex gating, staining, so on and so forth, identifying the cells, sorting them, and run qPCR. And then we proved that this class switching happens before the cells go into a follicle rather than after they have gone in there. So once again, <clears throat> a very important application. Um, another important application that we did was to check the affinity of peptides for MSC class one molecule. And this particular application has more um, relevance in vaccine um, development areas um, because we need to know the peptides which need to go in the vaccine preparation. And these peptides have to have affinity for the MSC molecule present on the cells in the people who are receiving that vaccine so that the peptides will go and bind to the MHC uh, receptors and then start the immune response. And that is particularly important. So if the peptides will not go and bind to MHC uh, molecules, then obviously they can't start an immune response at all. And this is very critical for um, peptide affinity. It's very critical for vaccine development. So you can do that by facts. I'm a bit of an elaborator, say, so I won't go into um, explaining the steps of that one, but enough to say that you can generate your um, standard curves, et cetera, by using competitor peptide and then measure the affinity and it's an, in a super quick way and also in a very easy, efficient manner as well. Switching gears. <clears throat> um, this work was part of um, the eye unit that we have here. And they work with the um, retina in case of, they study the effect of light damage, which is plenty in India. We know lots of people don't protect their eyes by wearing eyeglasses and sunglasses in the bright lights. But you must know that that light can damage our retina. So these people study that in mice and also they get samples from the humans. But also they wanted to see if the macrophages from the blood will get into the retina. So normally retina doesn't have these kind of cells. They wanted to see if these cells get into the retina and cause inflammation in the eye and then cause re, uh, degeneration. Normally you can't get these cells to stay in the culture. So what we did was we sorted those cells for them on our machines. When they brought us the retinal cells from the mice, we sorted them, gave them back. They tested many different media, and ultimately they were successful in having these cells grow in the cultures. So that was really good success. But then the stuff that was growing in the culture, we wanted to see if they are true cells, are they expressing the same molecules that the natural cells express? And we did that for mice as well as for human retina. So we do have access to human samples. And Normally, the, um, these cells will express these markers on um, them, and we stain these cells with those antibodies to show that, yes, 
the cells in the culture are expressing the same markers uh, for mouse retina cells, also for the human retina cells. That means we've got the same cell type that we find in the mouse retina as well as in the human retina, but this time we've got that in culture. So that was a good positive story. But the next thing was to see that, okay, we've got the correct cells, but are these cells um, able to do what they would do naturally? That means phagocytosis, can they ingest the stuff like they do normally? Yes. So we incubated them with the beads and we noticed that, yes, they do carry out phagocytosis just like they would. So that means that the cells growing in the culture were expressing the correct molecules, but also behaving functionally um, in the natural way as well. <clears throat> now, once again, changing gears and getting back to microbiology, um, normally um, the uh, sulfation does not occur in prokaryotes. So to find unnatural amino acids is a little bit um, difficult, they're quite hard, um, but um, we have a group who use um, E. coli and they try and um, find targets which are unnatural amino acids. And then these are, um, they do lots of cycles. So normally for this kind of assay, they have to um, go positive selections, negative selections, many, many kinds of selections and create big libraries. Uh, but pretty much they use our instruments for um, selecting their targets, which is really good. This is what they do with us. So we keep sele selecting positive and negative populations and they keep putting them back in the culture. But just sometimes in the five days itself, they're able to get their full library, um, which is far more quicker than months and months of uh, screening. So we pretty much offer high throughput system, which is easy to control. It saves lots of time and it reduces um, the precious um, reagents that they have to use. So we go one positive population, second time negative sorting, third time positive, fourth time negative, fifth time positive, and by fifth time you already have 91.5% positive population anyway. So um, that means that we go in five days, high speed, high efficiency, and give some good results. Now, the last of the thing that I'm going to mention is that I'm also part of development of um, a software which is uh, required for analysis of that much data when that gets generated. This software has been uh, generated in-house for identification of the cell populations, as you can see. There are lots of softwares available. We were just trying to improve on some of them. So this is in collaboration with one very smart student who's um, <clears throat> very well versed in R system and using that. So all of these subpopulations of cells that you are seeing on this screen, which is I think roughly 50 or 60, can be done in one tube by adding all of those antibodies to your cells and getting all of this information from just one tube of sample. But making sure that you've done this system very, very correctly, but you can get that much information from just one sample. <coughs> For that, obviously you identify your cell populations and generate phenograms to identify uh, differences in the samples that you might have. I think I'm gonna stop here. Um, I don't wanna make it too complicated. I don't want it to sound too complicated, um, but that's the school where I work. It's a new building. And outside of this building, you can't probably see it here, but it's got um, ATGC written all over. It won an award um, for the, like the building award. Um, that's my city. And that's the Australian government parliament house actually. And my university is somewhere here. And um, this is the balloon festival that happens in March um, when our, um, autumn starts. This is the festival of tulips, which is happening right now because we started our spring. We are exactly opposite of Indian um, seasons. So we started our spring from 1st of September and this festival is just opened last weekend. So I'll probably be going next weekend, um, but it's always the best time to have lots of flowers. Although uh, we had 
minus one yesterday. So I'm not sure how tulips are doing, um, but theoretically in spring, it's still very cold. Um, but I think I'll stop here. Um, I hope that it hasn't been um, too much complex sounding information, um, but I'm happy to take any questions at this point as well. Thank you very much. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, Hi. Thank you, ma'am. It was just an indeed an um, excellent experience, like a virtual tour to the life of the flow cytometry. I think it has been very much enlightening the student for the cell cycle analysis, proliferation of cells, stereotyping, so much topics we have touched about. The students are so much anxious to ask so many questions. Please. So with your due permission, should I start this? Okay, students, whosoever is going to ask question may unmute or even they can switch <laughs> on the cameras also. Over to the students, please. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Hi. I have one question. Hi. Yeah. Nice Say your name. Know. What's your name? I'm Mingita from BSc final year. Good to see you. Yeah. So like my question is that flow cytometry you have shown is quite sophisticated. So what could be the cost of basic one? Like I just want to have an idea. What could be the cost of the basic instrument? Yes, ma'am. So it can start from 100,000 US dollars. Okay, ma'am. So, like, it is interesting that this site flow cytometry has so much vast application. So, like, the processing of sample is different for different type of analysis. Correct. That is correct. The sample preparation is applicable to or is specific for the kind of analysis that you want to do. And so, what could be the time for one sample to process? Um, it doesn't take too long for the antibody staining. It usually takes about 30 minutes to 40 minutes, but you have to wash your cells and so on and so forth. Depending on if you have to get your cells from the animals, then obviously you have to process that part as well. So normally we start sorting at about nine o'clock in the morning. And some people sometimes have to come at 6 a.m. to start preparing their samples. So like, is it good possible that this processing could take days? No, no, no. It doesn't take days. No. Okay, no, it only Thank takes you. a couple of hours, not more than that. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome. Sir, you can come up with Perry. Good morning, ma'am. Hi, Sira. Sira, you may ask your question. Ma'am, I have a question. Mm -hmm. like, uh, what is the importance of uh, flow cytometer and how can the, uh, what is quality control in flow cytometer? Okay, so for quality control, we use performance tracking. We've got standard beads which are available from the companies, which we use to make sure that all the detectors are performing correctly, all the lasers are performing correctly. So we do all the background checks before we allow the users to start using the machines. And ma'am, why is it important? The quality control? Yes, ma'am. Oh, quality control is extremely important because if the sample doesn't work, then you don't know whether the laser did not work or the detection did not work, right? So we have to make sure everything is working to the best possible level so that your differences in samples can be picked up very easily as well then. Now, quality control is very, very critical. We measure the detection limits, we measure the background levels, we measure the electronic noise, we measure all little things that are in the machine to make sure. We even test our PBS sterility every day to make sure that we've got nice clean machine for people to use. Does that anybody, answer your question? Anybody else with the query? Yes, good morning, ma'am. I hey, good morning, ma'am. Uh, thank you for such an informative and interesting lecture. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, I just yeah. wanted to ask, like, uh, depending on the sophistication of the machine, does that matter, uh, like, uh, for contamination or, uh, uh, like, supposedly we are talking about uh, techniques as well, where we 
say that you have to handle the samples very carefully so that the contamination doesn't occur. So does that apply uh, apply to this technique as well? So if you're analyzing your cells, then contamination is not a thing. You can fix your cells and bring that in a buffer PBS and run on the machine. And then as the cells run, they go in the waste and we collect them in the um, bleach so that it is decontaminated. But if you want to recover your cells back, then you want to recover them nice and clean and not contaminated. And that's why we use a sterile autoclave PBS in our machines. We want to give you the best possible cells without the contamination so that you can culture them in the labs and also put them back in the animals or get pure DNA or RNA or whatsoever from them as well. So that's why we try to have them contamination free actually for all purposes. Okay, thank you, ma'am. And ma'am, I just uh, I just wanted to ask. I had another question. So, uh, uh, like we say that this can be used in the diagnosis purposes. This technique can be. So does it have to be a specific disease which has to be diagnosed, or uh, is it in general we can use it for diagnosis as well? So it can be used for diagnosis for any disease or any variation. For example, in cancer patients, it is used to see if the cancer cells are dividing, because it's dangerous if they're dividing, then you can sort the cells which are dividing to see what are the genes being expressed in the cells which are dividing. Can you suppress those genes? Those are the areas where the cancer research is working. But for the diagnosis and for the hospitals, as the cells are dividing, they're producing different things. You can determine that. Also the profile, the general profile of the cells changes as well. Are they expressing some new molecules or something like that that can be checked as well? Also in certain cases, the number of cells increase maybe from 10% to 90%. So now if you're determining a subset of cells, which has gone up from 10% to 90% in a certain disease case, then that will tell you that that definitely is abnormal. So abnormal populations in any disease condition is very important to know. And that is what flow cytometers are used for to check out the correct proportions. And actually the normal ranges are published and available um, by WHO, um, it's published. So we know the normal range of T cells, B cells, all of those things in our blood. And if things are abnormal, then you know that um, it has to be followed up for any disease or abnormality. Absolutely, these instruments are very, very important in the hospitals and they are present in all of those hospitals. And I actually am an assessor for quality control of those instruments in the hospital. So I do go and visit some of the hospitals as well. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Just to follow up with that. There is Abhinav. Abhinav, are you having question? You can type in the chat box also in case there is any network instability. Anyways, I think Komod had another question. No more questions. So I think Komod had so another question. Sorry. For your queries. Now I hand over the stage and the platform to our worthy head, Dr. Indu Mehta, to extend. Sonika, Sonika, one second. I think Komod had another question. Yes, thank you, ma'am. It was just a follow up to your uh, answer that you gave. I just wanted to ask, like, uh, some diseases we get uh, cell, cell receptors change in their composition or something during cancer cells when they're uh, treated with uh, certain cancer medicines. Uh, I can't hear you. Uh, is it clear now? Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to ask like cell receptors during uh, when cancer medicine is given, the cell response by uh, certain cell receptors uh, for uh, removal of all the cells, I think medicine out of the cell. So that receptors can also be uh, identified using this technique? Yes, absolutely. So you can have antibodies to the receptor molecule and then you can see if those receptor molecule proportions have gone down or have gone up or have not changed at all. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Welcome.
So, okay, if no more questions, ma'am, see, students, they are so much ang uh, anxious to know a lot about this interesting technique. That's very good. That's nice. Yeah. So, okay, uh, it's, it's a customary to say a thanks to each and everyone associated with us during this webinar. So I take this opportunity, it is my pride and privilege to propose a vote of thanks of today's webinar. First of all, I, on the behalf of our college management, Principal Dr. Ajay Sharma, all the faculty members of zoology department, teaching and non-teaching, would like to thank our today's speaker and my dear and my favorite ma'am, Dr. Harpreet Gora, for very kindly agreeing and sparing time for today's webinar. Uh, it is so interesting to learn that such a small sample can give such a vast information and um, we can analyze so many things. So it is always a delight to listen to you, ma'am. The talk was very informative and enlightening. And you have put it in such an interesting manner that it has made the students so very, you know, awakened. So thank you very much indeed, ma'am. I owe special thanks to our college management and our proactive principal, Dr. Ajay Sharma, for always encouraging and guiding us and always uh, motivating us to conduct such kind of webinars time to time. My humble thanks to my faculty and staff, Dr. Jyoti, Dr. Preeti, Dr. Sonika, Dr. Parul, Dr. Vinci, Dr. Sunana, and our staff, Kemaram and Sukhvinder for their help and support. I'm also thankful to head of the IT department and the automation cell of the college, Mr. Shamim, Mr. Keshu for their uh, technical help. Last but not the least, I express my sincere thanks to today's valuable audience, the teachers, my friends, and my students for not only uh, actively participating, but also making the best use of this opportunity. I'm sure the deliberations made by the speaker will be very well utilized by the audience in times to come. A big thanks to one and all. Have a nice day. Now, uh, I